All right, let's turn in our Bibles tonight to Isaiah chapter 9. I'd like to read a familiar passage, primarily verse 6 this evening. And it reads as follows, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Lord, thank you this evening for your word. Thank you for the worship, for the beautiful singing, Lord. And it just encourages our heart to reach out to you in song and to worship you even more. And Lord, as we consider this evening the words you have before us here in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. We trust that you will minister to us and through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Several weeks back, I had planned that this evening I would be in Matthew chapter 2. And this afternoon, um, as I was sitting and reading the passage and preparing, I felt what I can only describe as the urging of the Spirit to do something different. So this evening in Isaiah chapter 9, 6, I'd like to focus on the issue of peace. Because as I reflect on this year that we've been through and the times that we're living in, uh, I see a real lack of peace, not only in the world, but especially in the church, especially in the lives of Christians. I watch what Christians are posting on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and I see people who are bringing a sword rather than bringing peace. I see people who are struggling to gain peace. I see Christians who say they believe in Jesus Christ, but who are caught up in the ways of the world, uh, meaning they are caught up in the politics, caught up in the madness of COVID, caught up in the issues of wearing masks, caught up in the issues of social distancing, uh, every time you go in a store uh, somewhere, it's in your face, literally, isn't it? I was in a store a couple of days ago, and, um, it, well, several things happen in that particular situation, but, uh, you know, there's the, the tape on the floor and the spots where you're supposed to stay distanced, and uh, I was at the register paying, and there was this guy who was, like, in a hurry and couldn't wait. Nobody else in the store, but he's literally standing behind me, not even a foot you know, so you kind of have that going on. Then you have the extreme where you have people, you know, every time you move, they move. Have you ever experienced that in the store so far? You know, you're kind of just standing there kind of doing this and you kind of take a step and they're like taking a step away from you. So there's this, this craziness that's out there. It's infiltrated our minds. And as we think about Christmas and I read this passage here, the prophecy of Isaiah given several hundred years before the birth of Christ says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. What would the coming of Jesus do? What would that bring to us? And he says the government will be upon his shoulder. We know that that's true, but that's still a yet future prophecy to be fulfilled in his second coming. And it says, and his name will be called all of these things, there's many names that Jesus is called by, but here we are told wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. So as we think about these names, just to reflect upon them briefly this evening, his name will be called wonderful. How many people can you look at today, and maybe we certainly know some, some worthy people, but how many people can you look at and, 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 and use the, the word wonderful as their name? We might use it as an adjective to describe their character or their behavior. But no one is called by the name wonderful. What about counselor? There are certainly people in our society who are designated as counselors. But here, a counselor has a capital C, and it will be his name the one who will speak the words of life, the only one truly worth listening to. There's many 
voices in society, aren't there? Many clamoring to be heard, but none truly worthy of listening to. His name shall be called Mighty God. In the Old Testament, that would be El Shaddai. That would be one of the covenant names of God. Speaking of God's great power, his omniscience. Everlasting Father, a name attributed to God himself, but which would be attributed to the Son, thus confirming his deity as one of the Godhead, one of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity. And then finally, the title, Prince of Peace. And it's this name, this title, that we'd like to look at for a brief while this evening. Have you ever thought about a definition for peace? Peace, according to the Bible dictionaries, could be stated like this. It's a state of quiet or tranquility or calmness. Certainly something that we all need. A conscience that is not conflicted. Certainly one of the greatest problems we have is in our minds, isn't it? We can't shut our minds off at night. Or sometimes because we can't shut our minds off, we put something on in the background. I just need something in the background, some music. I need the TV going. Why? Because my mind is not at peace. My mind is constantly churning. It's conflicted. Another definition of peace, another aspect of it is harmony or unity. We don't see harmony and unity within the world. We don't see it within our political systems. We don't see it within our medical system. We see disagreement at every turn over the state of our, uh, our social living in this country and even in the world. Harmony and unity is something that we long for, and we can only find it in small social groups, small packs of people who agree with us and who agree with our points of view. Freedom from disturbance or agitation. All you got to do is go to a store and it doesn't take more than five minutes to get agitated, to get behind the wheel of your car in a parking lot, trying to find a parking space or trying to get out of the parking lot. It's just madness. Freedom from war. The earth has never been free from war. There has always been a place somewhere on the face of planet earth where war has been raging. Freedom from internal conflict. How many of us are just struggling with stuff on the inside? Freedom from interpersonal quarrels. I don't know about you, but some days I just long to, to be able to deal with people without strife. It seems that the strife is out there at every turn. It's, it's, in, it's in the stores. It's with the, the attendants helping us at the cash register. It's, it's everywhere we go. Freedom from anxiety, oh my goodness. Anxiety, stress, a lack of peace. The very first need, according to the Bible, of any person's life is to have peace with God. And that's the only peace that truly matters. In fact, peace cannot truly come to our lives until we first have peace with God. And just to remind you in the passage that we read, one of the titles of Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We know that ultimately one day he will conquer the earth and he will bring peace in a way that we can only imagine. We read it in the scriptures, it tells us about it, but it's not something we've ever experienced. Where the whole world will literally live in unity and harmony. Where the utopia that the existential writers write about in our literature, imagine, but it's not possible with man, it's only possible with God. The very first need for every person and in every person's life is to have peace with God. And this evening, if you do not know the peace that God offers you with himself through his son, Jesus Christ, then you do not and you will not ever truly know or understand peace because peace means to be reconciled with God. The word reconciled means that someone was an offending party and they have to be brought back to the one who was offended. And God says that we are the ones who need to be reconciled. You see, he was the one who was offended by our sin. Anytime we want to point our finger at God or shake our fist at him, we need to understand it's we who are in rebellion against him. 
He's not in rebellion against us. We are in rebellion against him. And so we need to be reconciled to God and with God. How does that happen? We need to be forgiven of our sins, our past, our present, and our future sins. We need to be free from the guilt of sin. The Bible speaks of the conscience and of the mind. And once the mind and the conscience is offended, once the, the conscience is uh, come to a place where it cannot resolve guilt, where it can't come to peace or to grips with things, that's a, that's a point where God is bringing us so that we will understand that we need peace with him. Second, the second greatest need after peace with God is to be at peace with those around us, with our fellow men and women. We can never truly experience peace with those around us until we have first experienced peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just to think about peace from a biblical point of view, in the book of Leviticus, which is a book that often we avoid because it speaks of offerings and sacrifices and grain offerings and the preparation of sacrifices in the Old Testament before God, yet uh, 32 times in the book of Leviticus, peace is mentioned. And these offerings, which were meant to help us have a right standing before God, this was of course before Christ came, were meant to achieve peace between God and man. In Psalm 119, verse 165, it says, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. So another aspect of peace is reading and knowing God's word. It's being in love with God's word, because God's word is his character, it's his nature, it's, it's his truth. So great peace have those who love your law. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 20 says, The seed is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. So those who bring peace have joy with God. And why do we have joy? We have peace with God first, and then because of the peace with God, we have peace with mankind. Proverbs 16, 7 says that when a man's ways please the Lord, he, that is God, makes even his enemies, that man, to be at peace with him. You know, there's a great way for us to make peace with our enemies. It's just to, to please the Lord in all that we do, and then allow God to make peace with our enemies. You see, God will do it for us if we will honor him and do the right thing. In Isaiah 9, 7, the very next verse in the passage we were looking at today, it says, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. You see, Jesus is the only one who can bring peace. In Isaiah 26, verse 3, it says these incredible words that every person ought to have underlined in their Bible or highlighted. It reads as follows, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. In this morning's devotion, we were reading in Luke chapter 2 about the prophetess Anna who had been living in the temple since she had lost her husband in death and for some 80 years or so she had been ministering to the Lord. And as she had been ministering to the Lord there in the temple, there daily seeking him and praying and, and, and worshiping and you know, just seeking to be a blessing to those who came to the temple for help and for peace. She had her mind stayed upon the Lord in that, in that moment when she realized that Jesus, the baby, had been brought to the temple to be circumcised and to be dedicated unto the Lord. In that moment, she just offered up a prayer of thanksgiving and an, a sacrifice of worship unto the Lord. You see, you will keep him in perfect peace, God says, whose mind is stayed on you. How's your mind? Are you thinking about and focused on the Lord? Isaiah 32, verse 17, the work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. In the next verse, Isaiah 32, 18, it says, my people dwell in a peaceful habitation, 
in secure dwellings and in quiet resting places. You see, God desires to give us peace. In Isaiah 52, it speaks of the person who loves God and it says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And that verse is quoted in Romans chapter 10, verse 15, and there it reads, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. You see, those who know the Lord and who are the bearers of light who take the truth of his gospel and the peace of his word to the people around us. You see, God brings peace not only to us, but through us to those who need peace. In Isaiah 53, that beautiful passage that we call the passage describing Jesus, the suffering servant for, I believe Isaiah was written about 700 years before Christ. It speaks prophetically of the person who would become the Messiah. And it says, but he, the Messiah, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. You see, peace is possible for you and for me because of what Jesus did for us. God laid upon him on the cross all of the wrath that he had mustered up against the sin of mankind for all of eternity. If you remember any of those passages in the Gospels that talk about the day of Christ's crucifixion, after he had been crucified in the morning around 9 a.m., about noon, the sky drew black and the sun was hidden. And these weren't just simple storm clouds, these were clouds of blackness. And this is when God was moving in to lay the wrath against sin upon his son. And in that moment, as Jesus was there on that cross for the next three hours from 12 noon till 3 p.m., the weight of sin was laid upon him. And Jesus came to this point in his life for the very first time in all of eternity. There was a rift in the Godhead when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, he was separated from his father. Because, as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, he became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And that's what Isaiah 53 is describing. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed this evening. If you need healing in your mind, In your thoughts, if you need peace, it only comes through Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah chapter 29, a passage that people often like to quote, uh, speaking uh, blessing over people and and good things for uh, their lives and the days ahead. In, In fact, I remember when our son graduated from high school, I think every graduation card that Uh, people we knew and and were associated with, most most of whom were church people or believers, gave him a card which had this verse in it. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Think about that, what God is saying there through the prophet Jeremiah. The thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, are thoughts of peace. How many people have I met? How many people do you know who think God is mad with them? Who thinks that that God is just angry with them because of things they've done? And listen, if you don't know Christ, if you've never trusted Christ, then yes, that's true. But you also need to understand the good news is that the wrath of God was satisfied in the person of Christ. And that when Jesus came to become the Prince of Peace, to be born as a baby, that one day he would grow up and become the the son of God who would take away the sin of the world. That this verse in Jeremiah 29, that God has thoughts of peace toward us to give us a future and a hope. You see, that's the peace of God for you and for me. And he says, Jeremiah 29, 12, then you will call upon me 
and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You see, just speaking from personal experience before I came back to the Lord, I came to know the Lord as a young child, but for many years I wandered away from him and partied and did all the crazy things. I could tell you stories that would make your skin crawl of things that I did. Every time I got sick from drinking too much or I got too high and became fearful of what was happening in my mind, I would cry out to God, but my crying out to God in those moments was only because I wanted temporary relief from my distress. I wasn't really seeking him for himself. I wasn't seeking him because he needed to be sought and because I needed him. I was seeking him because I wanted to get over my sickness. And I remember nights when I was in somebody's front yard at a party, barfing my guts out on their front lawn, crying out to God, God, if you just get me through this, I, know I won't drink ever again. And the next Friday night, I was back doing the same thing again. Crying out to God only because you need relief for the moment. You see, those who truly hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who seek God, those who come to him and say, Lord, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I need you. Those are the people that he reveals himself to. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, during the time when the Lord had revealed to Elizabeth and Zechariah that they were going to have this child in their old age, they had been barren all of their life, they were old, it was an old man and an old woman, and, and God allowed them to have this, this child, John the Baptist, and of course Mary was the, the, excuse me, Elizabeth was the cousin of Mary. But Zechariah, when the word came to him that this was going to happen, didn't believe he thought this was a crazy thing. He thought his wife was crazy. He's like, well, how can this be? This is just wild. And because he didn't believe, of course, God made him become a mute for the nine months that John was in the womb. And then on the day that John was born, Zacharias could finally speak again. And he said in Luke chapter one, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of sins, speaking of the fact that John, his son, would be the forerunner of, of the Christ. Through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, a reference to Jesus the Messiah, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. See, Zechariah knew in that moment by the Holy Spirit that his son would be the one who would proclaim the way of the Lord and that the Lord, the Messiah, the day spring, would be the one who would guide our feet into the way of peace. You see, there's so many references pointing to the fact that Jesus, and only through Jesus, would come peace. Jesus spoke in John 14 to his disciples on the night before he went to the cross. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus himself speaking those words to his disciples, and I believe by implication straight to you and me today down through the ages, that these are words meant for us. John 16, 33, two chapters later in the same period of evening, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, cheer, I have overcome the world. Don't we need to be reminded of that this evening, this Christmas, here at the end of 2020? If I hear another person say, I cannot wait for 2020 to be over, 2021's gonna, gonna be much better. And I'm not trying to be the Grinch, but I'm just gonna say, how do you know? Everywhere I'm hearing and reading says, masks and COVID is gonna continue for at least six months, maybe a year. When, the vaccine that everybody's putting their hope in isn't even going to be widely available for distribution to the masses till at least the summer. What are you placing your hope in, a vaccine? Masks? A new president? Or Jesus Christ? These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. You see, those words have been always true regardless of what year it is, or regardless of what's happening in our society, or regardless who wins the election, Jesus gives us peace. Not po politics, not money, none of that stuff. Peter, a little later, 
in Acts chapter 10, actually about 10 years after the crucifixion. Peter was speaking this sermon in the house of Cornelius as the Lord had called him to go speak the, the gospel to the Gentiles staying at his house. And Peter said, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You see, a key component of the gospel is that the gospel is about Jesus Christ, and Jesus is the one who brings peace, first peace with God. Secondly, he makes peace with our fellow man possible. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes this. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, meaning we've believed in Christ by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You see, we're justified by faith, and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I know I'm, I'm, I'm beating the point here, but do you understand that peace can only be found in Jesus Christ. And it's not just salvation. It's not just a one-time thing. You see, we need to come to Christ daily. As we read earlier from Psalm 119, we need to be in his word. His word reminds us of and brings that peace back to our minds and, and fills our hearts. How about this one from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33? Paul was writing to a very conflicted and confused church. And as he was writing there in chapter 14, he said, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. You see, there's a key way we know when confusing things are happening in our lives or when confusing things are happening in our relationships or confusing things are happening in the church. God is not the author of that which begs the question, who is? And I'll give you the simple, straightforward answer. It's the devil. You see, he's the one who's always angry. He's the one who's angry with God, and he, he, he forces his hatred into the world, and he's constantly speaking against and preaching against Christ through the many emissaries he has in the world. God is not the author of confusion. Satan is. God is the author of peace. And he wants to bring peace to you and me. Paul, at the end of 2 Corinthians, said, Finally, brethren, farewell, become complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. You see, there's a key component of peace. If we're people of peace, if we're seeking to be at peace with God, if we're seeking to be at peace with one another, if we're seeking to bring peace to the lives of other people, God will bless that. And as a reminder in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, where we are told of the fruit of the Spirit, I'll read it to you. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control the fruit of the Spirit. You see, the Spirit of God bears peace in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul reminded us, saying that Jesus had broken down the wall that separated us from God and separated us from men. And he said in Ephesians 2, 14, for he himself, speaking of Jesus, is our peace. In Ephesians chapter 4, the next chapter, he says that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. You see, peace is something we must pursue. It doesn't just happen. We have to seek peace. But then again, coming back to God working in our lives and the need for peace, and I submit to you today that we all have a need for peace actively in our lives. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Again, another set of verses that I would recommend people underline and highlight in their Bibles. And the, a place that we go in those moments of turmoil and crisis, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Let me tell you what this verse means. Let me break it down for you for just a moment. We are to be anxious for nothing. And in those times when we have anxiety, we have stress and we're feeling it and, and we're just, we can't control it. We're just, our minds are out of control. The world is out of control around us. He says here in the midst of that, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in all things, by prayer and supplication. Prayer is just crying out to God. It's speaking to God. Supplication is to lift up specifically your needs before God with thanksgiving. We are to be thankful to God and just begin to thank him for the answer that's going to come, even in when we're in the moment of distress. He says, let your requests be made known to God. Tell God, God's not afraid of our request. There's not anything that you, can, you and I can speak to God about that he's never heard before. He's not going to be surprised because we say we have a crisis. He knows that. And he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, that means it transcends understanding. Listen, and I've experienced this, and I know many of you have. When you pray, when you're in the midst of a maddening crisis of just stuff going on around you, God is able to bypass your mind and go straight to your heart and bring peace to your life. And it says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. That word guard it means to be a sentry, like a guard posted with a gun, with a sword, whatever makes you happy, hand grenades, bombs, okay, razor wire. He's a guard to your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. You see, in Ephesians 6, Paul talks about the armor of God, and one of the pieces of the armor of God he talks about, and he says, hey, put on the helmet of salvation. Why do we need to do that? Because the helmet protects the head. The helmet protects the mind. The helmet of salvation reminds us that we belong to him. And he is the God of peace, and he can bring the peace of God to my life, to your life. Finally, it says that by him in Colossians chapter 1, that he made peace through the blood of his cross. We have peace with God. And Colossians 3 kind of picks up the idea in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and it says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And when it says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, that word rule means to act as arbiter. That means, let the peace of God act as the decision maker in your heart. And you see, sometimes we, we have this conflict in our lives as we're facing a major decision or a major issue in our life, and we, and we don't know what to do. And we're like, God, what should I do? Well, God has given us the instrument of peace as an indicator in the path of making decisions. And say, Lord, show me what will bring peace. And as we pray, and we say, God, show me. I've got option A, I've got option B. One brings peace, the other one does not. Go with, go with the one that brings peace. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Act as arbiter to which you also were called in one body and be thankful. And then uh, at, in the book of 1 Thessalonians, Paul said, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, your whole spirit, soul, and body. God wants to give us peace, not just in, in a measure, not just in a moment, not just as a cup, drink it as a remedy, but he wants to bring peace to our lives in a very complete and a full way. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says, one of the ways that we achieve peace is by fleeing from sin and calling on him with a pure heart. Another way in Hebrews 12 is that we are to pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. In James chapter 3, it says the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. You see, often we pray for wisdom, don't we? God, I need wisdom. How, how do I live? What do I do? What, what decisions do I make? The wisdom that comes from above, that comes from the throne of God, brings peace. It's peaceable. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You know, when we see things going on around us, could be in our families, friendships, relationships, God allows us to see those things often so that we'll step forward and become a peacemaker. You see, making peace for a believer, acting as an arbiter for others, is something that God has called us to do. And it makes sense in light of everything we've talked about. If I'm someone who's experienced the the peace of God and I have peace with God, and I see people who are not at peace with one another, I want to be a peacemaker. I want to bring peace to their lives so that they can know the same peace with God that I have, but also that they can know peace with one another. You see, there's a beautiful verse in Psalm 46, verse 10, and it says, cease striving and know that I am God. In these days, I have seen nothing but strife again, even in the church, but if we will cease striving, we will know that he is God, we will experience his peace. Again, Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, for unto us is a child is born, born unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So this evening, as we move into a, a, you know, time with family and just enjoying one another, let me ask you, for those of you who don't know Christ, why not come to him? Why not know the God of peace? Why not know the Prince of Peace, the Son of Peace? He wants to bring peace to your life. He wants to bring hope. He wants to bring life everlasting. I can tell you that as I trusted in Christ, I, I used to think, Uh, it was going to make me weird. In fact, coming to Christ has made my life more exciting. It's brought excitement and joy and peace to my life, and it's given me a purpose by which I can live to bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel of peace to others this evening. If you don't know the Prince of Peace, let me introduce you to him. His name is Jesus. And this evening, if you do know Christ, but you've been living in the madness of this world and you've been having anything but peace in your life, let me encourage you this evening to return to the Lord. It says in, I think it's Acts chapter three, as it talks about how the spirit of the Lord is moving there in those early days in the church. And it says, repent and uh, allow times of refreshing to come into your lives through repentance. Repentance means simply to turn from whatever we're doing and to turn back to the Lord. And so this evening, if we need peace, if you need peace, peace can be found nowhere but in Jesus Christ. Can't be found in politics. Can't be found on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever you use. Can only be found in Jesus Christ. So this evening, Lord, thank you. The peace we need, we know is in you. We look to you, we trust you. And Lord, we ask this evening if there's anyone out there listening or maybe even at a later date listening to this message online that they would be drawn to you like a moth to the flame and that they would say to you, Lord, in their own hearts right now, Jesus, I need you. I need that peace in my life. I don't know what it means, God. Just show me. Lead me in the days ahead. And Lord, we know that you will do that. You are trustworthy. In fact, you're the only one who can be trusted. There's no voice on the face of this planet we can trust except yours. And Lord, for those of us who know you, but who have been experiencing great turmoil and difficulty in our lives this evening, we invite you, Lord, to bring that peace back into our lives. And may we press into you these next couple of days as we have some downtime with family to open your word, to seek your face, and to let you minister to us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song to close and then we're dismissed. God bless you. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, If you need anything, if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know. We'd love to do that and and help you in any way. If we can pray for you this evening, just come on over and we'll just uh, lift you up before the Lord. All right. God bless you.